Well, good morning. <laughs> uh, I have just a couple of announcements first. Let me do those first and uh, tell you what's going on. In the back of the room, there's a big black sign that says everyone on it. And, uh, and if you squeeze those bulbs and twist them to the, uh, to the right there and turn them on, they'll come on. And, and what we're asking over the next uh, little bit of our series here is that you, congregation, share your faith with people. Now, you can do it several different ways. You can actually talk to them about uh, Jesus and, and the gospel and, and get into that. You can invite them to church. Uh, you can uh, engage them even on, on social media. Now, I, I'm not really a fan of the, if you love Jesus, you'll repost this uh, thing. So I'm not really a fan of those. But, but you could even talk to somebody uh, and have a conversation. But the issue is a conversation, that you're going to actually talk to someone about this thing. And if you'll do that, every time you do that, uh, you can turn on one of those lights. And it's our hope that maybe even by the end of the year, we can have that lit up. And uh, as a church... We believe that the gospel is for everyone. It's for everybody. And that when people really start to understand who Jesus is and, and they really start to understand who God is and who they are in God, uh, that, that, that lights people up. That changes them. And, and we really do believe that and we really do think that's true. And so uh, we're going to challenge one another to do that. And there's one bulb lit right now. Um, maybe even this week, that one or two of you have talked to somebody, and if you have, that's okay. Uh, again, don't grade yourself real hard on that. If you've had a conversation with somebody, you've talked about faith, you've, you've tried to bring it up, you invited somebody to church, even if they didn't come, you know, you put the invitation out there, uh, we'll, we'll light one up there. And uh, hopefully we can encourage one another as we're lighting that up. On the same vein of thought, Amanda has made up these, uh, these booklets here. If you didn't pick one up when you came in, you're welcome to. You don't have to, of course. They're just notebooks. Uh, uh, I guess the thinking is you'd take sermon notes, but if you make grocery lists out of them, that's fine too. And, and you can take that if you want to, and, and they're free one uh, per customer. And, and these stickers, if you're into such things like on your water bottle or whatever else, if you want to take one of those, uh, you can do that too. And uh, these uh, handsome uh, uh, t-shirts uh, that uh, uh, kind of go with the series. Amanda says that you can order those too, either in the connect area outside or online, but she's only going to do that for one more week. And I don't know that looking at me wearing it's going to really sell them, but you'll see others wearing them today too. Uh, our, our elders and deacons and staff, they all have these on, so uh, uh, you might see a few more of those. I wanted to mention the Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 project. Um, uh, we, we do a project where we're building beds for people in the community, uh, kids who don't, who don't have beds. And it's been one of the best benevolence things I've ever been part of. It's, it's been, it engages a lot of people who can use their gifts in ways that maybe hadn't done it before, and that's exciting. Um, uh, but, but, but then we're, we're, we're meeting the need of, of children who don't have a place to, you know, if the family's kind of in bad shape, uh, getting them a bed might be something you put off and put off and put off. And, and as we've been doing this project, we've, we've built some beds for kids who are teenagers who have never had a bed in their home. They've always had to sleep on the floor. They've always had to sleep in a couch or a chair. And, and I know it's a little stupid, subtle thing, but we think it's making a great big difference. And maybe, hopefully, Lord willing, some of those kids when they're adults will remember that God loved them and the church cared for them. Uh, and, uh, and you can be part of that too. If, and, and I should mention, even if you're not uh, 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 savvy about carpentry. You know, you don't really know the difference between a two by four and a two by six. That means nothing to you. It's just mumble, mumbling uh, around there. Uh, you still can find a place to help. And uh, so, uh, three different work days. Uh, Thursday, October 12th, uh, they're doing a one from 6 to 8.30, and they're going to be sanding that night. On Saturday morning, October 14th, 9 a.m. to 12 p.m., they're doing some staining and some drilling. And on Saturday afternoon, October 14th, they're going to be doing some drilling and some staining there too. And so if you're interested in that, uh, you can check in at the, at the Connect area. And I think you can check in for that online too. But last but not least, a hangout on the Hill, Friday, September 22nd. Uh, uh, Let's see, today's the 17th, so next, this coming Friday, uh, we're just going to have a thing across the road there. If you're new, uh, it's just a place to hang out. We're going to we'll grill some hamburgers, and, and there will be some, some music playing, and, and there really isn't a program. Just get a chance to meet people and talk to people in the church. If you're interested in that, please come. 
And it's a, a, I do think, and I've told two or three people, that, that this time of year, I think this is the prettiest part of the country. So to come out here, if it's a nice night, and just hang out with us and visit with one another, I want you to know you're all invited to do that. Uh, over the last a few weeks, if this is your first Sunday, I've not been around. Uh, I, I very rarely get cheered for like that when I get up here in any, <laughs> in any venue. So I've not been around, and, uh, and, and I'm back, and I've been gone for a couple of months. And I need to, I need to thank a lot of different people who have, who have jumped in great big while I while I was gone. I need to thank Josh, who covered the bulk of the sermons while I was gone and did a real good job. I want to thank uh, Gabe, who did a, a sermon or two there. And, 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 and Josh and Gabe both covered a lot of stuff behind the scenes that you don't see, and I, and I really do appreciate that because I was gone and it enabled me to get away. I want to thank the rest of the staff, Amanda and, and Connie and Julia and, uh, and Sarah. They came through in big and small ways all the way through this thing to just to, to cover stuff. And and I really appreciate it. I think the church didn't miss a beat while I was gone, and, uh, and I'm so grateful uh, for that. Our elders and deacons came in there and, and took on different responsibilities, probably that they didn't have to normally carry. Certainly want to thank uh, Toby and, and Danielle, and, uh, uh, who came in and, and, and uh, covered the worship for me while I was gone, and will continue to take a big role in that. And Rick, certainly, who came in early every day uh, on Sundays there and made sure all the sound was set up and all the things were going, so so that somebody was here who knew all the technical stuff. And there's lots of people I'm sure I'm missing who came in and, and were able to make a big difference there. If, you're, if this is your first Sunday, I don't often take that much time away. That, that was a, a unique thing. We've been here 15 years, and it was kind of a 15-year uh, gift for us uh, to get to do that, and, and we're grateful for it. Uh, uh, to get away and, and to do that. And, 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 and it kind of uh, challenged me on a couple things, and I'm going to get to the sermon, I promise, but, but just challenged, challenged me for a couple things uh, that I, I would like to share. The whole agenda for it was for me to try to get close to God, go rest in God. That was kind of the deal, which is kind of daunting. Because normally when I go for a vacation, and I expect when you do too, you're mainly just thinking about fun or maybe relaxation, and that really is the beginning and end of your thinking. And we did some of that. I mean, I don't want to pretend like uh, we went to the Redwoods and, and, uh, and San Francisco, which was really nice where we were at, and, and, uh, and Lake Tahoe. We were in Lake Tahoe when the Bidens were there, and we never hung out, but we were there at the same time, and I could see why he likes it. I can see why he thinks it's cool, because it, it was pretty cool. And I got to see a lot of things that I hadn't got to see uh, before. And, and, and so there was some of that. But there was also lots of time, again, in the Redwoods and different places, just to think about who God is and what God's doing in my life and, and, and where I'm going. And I do recommend, um, maybe not a big, you know, a lot of people can't take three or four weeks off to, to do something like that, but even a day. And I've done that before, take a day and my soul is revived just walking around Spring Mill by myself sometimes, you know, and, and really allowing God to kind of get in my head and try to think more along those lines and to take an extended period of time to do that just reaffirmed in my heart that God really is good and that God really does have a plan for me and I think a plan for us and that God really is showing up in big and small ways. And, and, and that was, uh, was encouraging. I got to read a couple of different books uh, uh, while I was out, and, and a, three, a couple, three books, and, and that were all pretty uh, encouraging to me. One of the books that I read was by a guy named John Mark Comer, and uh, it Live No Lies, which I think is his best book. If you like John Mark Comer, I think, I, I don't think it's close. I think Far and Away, his best book. I was really uh, kind of blown away by it. And, uh, and, and in the middle of it there, he talks about... Uh, uh, humans, people, have the ability to imagine a new reality. And that really is what separates us from the, the animals, is that no other animal can do it. But we can imagine a different reality than the one that we're in. Now, reality, he defines it as uh, what hits you when you're wrong. Uh, a kid on top of the roof with cardboard wings believes he can fly. If he jumps off the roof, reality will hit him in about one second after he jumps off the roof, right? Reality might have hit you sometime through the years. You know, you thought you could get away with something at work or, or with, your, uh, with your family there or, or, or with a friend or, or just uh, with the, well, on, the, on the highway there. Thought you could, you know, what's, if five miles are fine, what's six? And you just suddenly you're 10 and 15 miles over the limit. And you thought you'd get away with it. And then reality found you. 
in, in the form of a, of a hard word or an argument or a police officer asking how fast you was going. And then all of a sudden, you're kind of brought right back into, oh, okay, I got to straighten up. And every animal learns to recognize reality. You can put a great big cow out in the, in the field with an electric fence, and, 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 and she might test that one or two times, but after about the f- uh, second time, for sure, she puts her nose up against it. She'll never test it again. She'll learn that that little wire carries a big wallop, and she'll learn not to get too close to it. And, and every animal does that. People do that, too. We learn where the boundaries are, where reality is, and we learn to respect that. But humans, people, can imagine a different reality than the one that we're in. And that separates us. That's why we build buildings. And that's why we buy clothes. And that's why we uh, invest in relationships. Because we can imagine that with just a little bit of care, a little bit of attention, a little bit of work, this could be better than it is right now. It don't have to be like this. I mean, this is good or this is bad, either one. But it could be better than this. And we can imagine that. and And we work towards that thing that we can imagine. Now, sometimes our imagination can go the other direction. Um... Uh, because if you take a chance two or three times and get smacked down, you might start telling yourself, it'll never get better. It'll never change. I'm always going to be this way. I'm always going to lose. I'm always going to be less and, 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 and not where I want to be. And, and you can learn to kind of give up. Sometimes your mind can chase conspiracy theories and assume that everybody's laughing at you behind your back or everybody else is enjoying some better thing than you're enjoying. You can go to Facebook and rather than, or Instagram and rather than celebrate what others are doing, all you feel is how you're missing out and your mind can take you down a bad path. But, the, but that's the gift of it, right? And, and, and so what we want to do is learn to train ourselves to try to seek that, that better reality. And ultimately, that's what the gospel is. It's that, it's that better reality, that God has put us here for a purpose, that God has a plan for our lives. And maybe you've not got to do everything that you want, but it was God's intent to, to do good things for you. And, and I'm not talking about being rich or, or, or good looking or, or have the fastest car, although any of those things might be part of it, but it's about having peace and joy and, and, and love and, and, and a heart that's transformed And that was always the plan, that people covered up with sin could walk away from that and come close to God and that he would bless them. And and I guess it takes some imagination to see that. I think part of being a Christian is to to use your imagination to imagine this better world that we're supposed to be part of. Uh, uh, God loved the world so much that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him won't perish, but will have eternal life. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but to save the world. God didn't send Jesus down here to make you feel guilty or ashamed. Now, guilt, of course, in and of itself is not good or bad. It's the, it's the check engine light on your, on your dashboard. Sometimes that guilt comes on because you did something wrong, you know, Sometimes the guilt comes on because you did make a mistake. You feel guilty about it. You need to fix it. But a lot of times, guilt can morph into shame, and, and that lights on all the time, no matter what we're doing. I'm never going to be worthy. I'm never going to be what I'm supposed to be. And God didn't come to condemn you. God came to, to lift you up. And we, us, the, the bunch of us here, we're agents of that change. We've heard the message, and we're supposed to take it out to people. Jesus says you're the light of the world, and so you let your light shine before men so they can see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We're going to come back to this verse again and again in this series, but but this this is kind of our marching orders. Jesus did it, now he wants us to do it. And so over the next few weeks, I'm going to talk about some stories where Jesus did it, where he goes and talks to somebody who, for whatever reason, has, has kind of walked away from God and and, uh, and Jesus brings him back. And he does it several different ways. And some of the things he does, only Jesus can do, like miracles and healing and stuff. But most of it's not that. Most of it's just showing affection when nobody else will. Uh, stopping to talk when nobody else will do it. And so I want to talk about that. And so our, our, our sermon uh, today is on, that's on John chapter 4. And if you've got your Bible, you can read along with me. I'm going to put a lot of it on the screen 
Uh, I'll skip some verses there towards the end, but if you want to read it, it's in John chapter 4. And even as just good literature goes, you know, comparing it to uh, Mice and Men or, uh, or Huck Finn or something like that, it's good literature, John 4. It is a good story, even if you don't totally dig all the supernatural parts of, of Jesus. It's still a cool story. It's cool how it's written, and it has really good characters, and you can imagine how both these people acted and and so we're going to get into it. And so it starts off, I was saying this here. Now, Jesus, he had to go through Samaria. Um, I think I've talked about this before, but Israel's mostly a rectangular country. Jerusalem and all the stuff at the bottom of the rectangular country, that's called Judea in that time period. That's where most of the Jews lived. Jesus was born in a section up in the top of it called Galilee and, and Nazareth and all that area. And then there was this middle band where it was called Samaria. And, and Samaria, uh, 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 the Samaritans and the Jews don't get along. Uh, 700 years before Jesus, uh, the, the Assyrians came and conquered the northern part, and they took a lot of the Jews away, and they brought foreigners in, and the foreigners kind of mixed with the, the Jews who were there, and they kind of made their own religion. And they rejected a lot of stuff about Jewish. They rejected David, they rejected, and David's line they rejected prophecy. They thought that a lot of that, they didn't know if they believed in that or not. They didn't like Isaiah and Jeremiah and those kind of guys. They, they rejected uh, uh, most of the Bible except for the first five books. They just didn't think it was important. And, and they, they, they rejected Jerusalem. They thought they could worship on their own mountain there in Samaria. And the Jews and the, and the Samaritans from 700 years before Jesus until, until this time, they fought with each other. And they, they argued, and, and, and it affected Samaria. I, I heard a guy say in a message a couple of, of years ago that, that economically affected them. I mean, Samaria was a poorer area. It didn't have as much going on. Uh, they, they were rejected by the people above them and below them. Uh, there was a racial division and, and a lot of animosity. And when Alexander the Great rolled over all of that area in the 300s, he allied with the Samaritans because he knew they hated the Jews and so he wanted to get the Samaritans to help him, so that made things worse. And then when the Maccabees came in about 100 years before Jesus, uh, they burned the Samaritan temple, and the Jews really kind of rolled over Samaria and, and, and kind of subjugated them for a while. And so these groups just hated each other and had hated each other for, for, for hundreds of years. And so by the time Jesus was there, people wouldn't go through Samaria on that, on that rectangle. If somebody down here needed to get up here or vice versa, they would, like the Jordan Rivers here on the book mine, they would go to the Jordan River and cut around Samaria. They just wouldn't go through it. But Jesus felt like he had to go through it. And I think he had to go through it because he wants to talk to somebody there, and we'll get into that. And, and so he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, which probably is the Old Testament city of Shechem, probably the same place uh, where Abraham first came through, where Jacob uh, built a big temple uh, to God. Uh, and, and so it's kind of an important city in Old Testament thinking. And he comes to Sychar uh, near the plot of ground where Jacob uh, had, had given to his son uh, Joseph. And Jacob's well was there. And Jesus, he's tired from all this walking. And so he sits down by the well, and it was about noon. So it's really hot, and the sun's shining down, and, and it's a desert community. It might be over 100 degrees there, and so he's kind of all by himself. And, and, and a Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus asked her, would you give me a drink? Now, his disciples, they're not there. They went into town to get food. So he's all by himself, and this woman comes up. And this is weird for him to be talking to her, and she notices that it's weird. She says, you're a Jew. And I'm a Samaritan woman. How are you asking me for a drink? Because Jews don't associate with Samaritans. This is like a, a Ku Klux Klan asking a Black Panther for a drink of water. It's just, we, we know that we hate each other. Who do you think you are to do this to me? And, and, and I guess she mentions Samaritan woman. Uh, in, in Jewish uh, religious people, men would not talk to women in public. A husband might not even talk to his wife in public, uh, uh, but uh, uh, might, maybe to his wife, but that would be about it. And so Jesus is talking to her like, like we're just hanging out. And so she's kind of taken back by it and probably a little offended by it. And, and, and so Jesus says to her, and this is a pretty important line, he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is asking you for a drink, you'd ask him and he'd give you living water. Now, I highlighted two or three parts of that because they're all important. 
he says, you don't know two things. You don't know the gift of God. And most of the rest of their conversation, that's what he's going to talk about, is the gift of God. You don't know the gift of God, and you don't know who you're talking to. And uh, now for a lot of people, that probably ends the conversation. Okay, dude. And you just uh, take a step back, and, and you walk out there and, and get away. But it doesn't with this woman. And we're going to learn more about her as we go on. But whatever else is going on with her, she's smart. I mean, she goes toe-to-toe with Jesus the whole time. They just keep going back and forth, and they just keep bantering back and forth. And she's quick, and she's kind of sarcastic. We'll get to that in a minute, too. And I probably would have liked her uh, if, if, if I would have gotten to, to talk to her because she's, she's clever in how she does. So this doesn't intimidate her at all, and we'll get to, into some of that there, uh, too. Uh, she can probably sense that Jesus is talking about more than just getting something to drink here at this point because it is creepy kind of language. He's taking it up a notch. But, but even this living water thing, uh, there was a famous uh, quote by a guy named Jeremiah, and he was talking for God, and he said, my people, this is in Jeremiah 2.13, my people have committed two sins. They've forsaken me, he says, the spring of living water, uh, and they've dug their own wells, their own cisterns, broken cisterns that can't hold water. And so, uh, by the way, this, this verse here, and it's poetic, it, this, is a, this is the human condition. This is the human condition. My people have committed two sins. They rejected me. I can give them love and joy and peace. I can, they've rejected me. But then, but then they've turned to these other broken wells, and, and, and they're not, not only are they not satisfying, it just, it's just crazy behavior. That's what he's saying, God says about his people. And this is the human condition. It's what we do. I mean, we know better and we still run after the stupid things. We know better and we still uh, get into to dumb things. You can talk to a kid, a preteen, and say, why did you do this stupid thing? And he'll say, I don't know. But the, the, but the answer is, even when I'm an adult, that's the answer. Julia will say, why did you do this stupid thing? I don't know. I don't know. It made sense in the moment. I don't know what I was thinking. And there's no good reason for it. And it's, it's I don't know why we do the thing. I don't know why I do the things I do. And, and uh, so maybe, because it's living water. See, he mentions that in this thing. This is kind of a famous thing that Jeremiah said. And maybe the woman has some sense that he's trying to steer the conversation to something else. But she doesn't bite right off. She goes right back at him. And uh, let's see here. If I, she, says, uh, she says, sir, you got nothing to draw with. He said, if you knew who was, you asked me for living water. You got nothing to draw with this well's deep. Where are you going to get living water? And living water doesn't have to be spiritual. It can just mean moving water. You're like a spring, not a, not a well, but a spring. Where are you going to get this? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself? And so did his sons. And, and, his and you could miss this thing as you're reading it. But it's a, it's a jab from the lady. She's taking a little jab at him here, kind of a little dig at Jesus. She said, our father Jacob. Because the Jews and the Samaritans disagreed about that. They thought that Jacob was Jew and he had nothing to do with Samaritans and, 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 and he would have rejected the Samaritans. And, and so she's kind of taking a little dig here at him. And, and taking a dig at him when he probably when he says this, if you knew who you were talking to, like I'm important, he's kind of letting her know that. You think you're so important, you're bigger than Jacob? You know, she's kind of taking a little dig at him. Well, but Jesus doesn't bite. He doesn't get into any of that. He says, he says everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. He says, indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. And I want you to, I mean, we want to move on with the story, but catch the beauty of this thing here. What Jesus has taught, I don't know if you've, the picture of being really thirsty. You know, you've been out in the sun and you've been working really hard or you've been running or exercising and you're just really thirsty, and that first drink of really cold water, and it just, it runs all through your head, and, and, and you can feel it going down your throat, and, and almost immediately you're better, you know, that emotion, and Jesus is comparing that to a spiritual thing, he says, he says to those of you who are thirsty, I'm going to do something where you'll never thirst again, and we know what it's like to be thirsty, we know what it's like to feel like our lives aren't enough, that I'm not fast enough or strong enough or smart enough or, or good-looking enough or rich enough to get whatever it is I need to get done. We all know what that feels like. And, and, and that to be thirsty, that, like, God, I need to matter more than I do. And he says, I can give you something where you won't do that anymore. 
that feeling of being satisfied, you'll have that all the time. And so she says, well, that'd be great. Sure, hand me that water, and then I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here. So she's kind of trying to shut him up. And Jesus says, well, go, okay, go call your husband and come back. And this is probably, this could, this could come off in America in, in 2023 as kind of condescending. But again, in that day, men didn't normally talk to women. It looked like you were flirting. And, and, and if, the guy, if the woman did have a husband, he could be ticked off that another man would dare to talk to his wife out in public. So in that day, it wouldn't have been, it's kind of a polite thing to do. They go call your husband. I have no husband, she says. And Jesus says, you're right when you say you have no husband. He says, the fact is, you've had five husbands, and the man you have now is not your husband. What you said is very true. There's this uh, uh, Christian movie thing going on now it's a, a, the, called The Chosen. If you've never seen The Chosen, I, rec- I think it's really good. It's, a, lot of, a lot of it's very good. But you can find this scene on YouTube where Jesus talks to a Samaritan woman, and, and Jesus really freaks her out in this moment, you know, we're just having a conversation. Jesus even knows in the, in the Chosen where they're showing this story, he can even tell her the names of some of these husbands. I mean, he knows. And, and, and it, kind of, it kind of freaks her out. And so Jesus is on purpose taking the conversation to a pretty deep level, and she, she sees what he's doing there. And so she says, I can see you're a prophet. And I, in my head, now on the Chosen, there's no big pause there. In the, in, the, in the Chosen, uh, she says, oh, I see you're a prophet. You're here to make me feel bad. And it kind of goes that direction. I, I, I think it's more like, okay, I can see. I see I'm out of my depth here. So again, she kind of tries to change the subject. She says, our, our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you Jews, you claim that the place we have to go is Jerusalem. So again, she's not talking about water here. She's just trying to get under his skin. And, and by the way, I mean, in America, we know what that's like, right? That's so easy to do today. Just so crazy, stupid, easy to do to get under people's skin. Oh, I see you're wearing a mask. And depending on who you say that to, they're ticked off, you know? Uh, or the other way, hey, I need you to wear a mask if you come in here. Oh, really? And it's just a mask. And people just can get red hot mad about it. You know, certain political issues. I can just ask a little innocent question and the other person's all ticked off all of a sudden. You know, and, and some t- people do it on purpose. They like seeing the world burn. And so they'll, they'll, they'll toss out little darts like that all the time just to get everybody riled up at the office or, or at the church or whatever else. And, and so that's what she's doing. She knows this will, this will tick off any Jewish man. So she just tosses that out at Jesus you know, and, and basically to say, we have nothing in common, but Jesus, again, doesn't take the bait. He says, woman, believe me, a time is coming when you're not going to worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans, you, you worship what you don't know, and we worship what we do know. Salvation's from the Jews. Again, you could take this like a dig from Jesus, and maybe it was, this, this sentence. It might have been, he's not denying that the Old Testament is real. He's not denying that Jerusalem has a special place in history. I think that's all he's saying here. But to make it really clear that he's not trying to get her, he said a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers are going to worship the Father in spirit and truth. He says these are the kinds of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and worshipers just need to worship him in spirit and truth. We get real attached to our buildings. We build these pretty buildings uh, for church, and we get real attached to them. And, uh, and we can start to think that this building is a big part of, of my faith. I do that. I missed being here in this building with you. I did. I missed, I missed being here and talking in this building with you. I, I missed it. I missed walking up the stairs and... Uh, and the smells of it, believe it or not, and just being here. I, 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 I did, but it's just a building. And if we painted the walls orange next week, it would still just be a building. Pews or chairs or bean bags, it doesn't really matter. It's just a building. The thing that God wants is your heart. It's always been your heart. 
But we get attached to these things, and they got attached to those things. And the Jews would say, oh, no, 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 only Jerusalem, only in this building. And the Samaritans said, oh, no, 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 only on this Mount Gerizim, only on this mountain. This is the only place it can happen. And Jesus is saying, that really isn't how this works anymore. It's not what God's after. God wants your heart. Can I tell you this, church? God wants your heart. When we talk about the things that really matter in this life, if I, if I were to get into your minds, you all have different goals, things you're trying to accomplish in 2023, you know, things you're trying to get done at work. I need to get to here. I need to get this done. I need to get this promotion. Things for your kids. I want my, kids to be the, I want my kid to be the starter on the team. I want my kid to be a, a straight-A student. The goals you have uh, for your house. I want my house to look a certain way and to be a certain way, and I want it to uh, have a big curb appeal or, or, or goals, whatever it is. We all do that all the time. And, and all those goals, even if you achieved every one of them, they're not going to change your heart. As soon as you get them done, there will be something else to do. God says, I came to give you something else, living water. And somebody who takes this living water from me, they'll never thirst again. And the kind of worshipers that Jesus is looking for are people who give their whole heart and mind to him. A person who is full of joy and peace and love and patience, they have no need for anything else. It really is the secret to having it all. And so many people miss it. And the woman, when she hears all this stuff, she basically tries to end the conversation. Well, I know Messiah's coming. Maybe when he gets here, he can tell us about that. And she says, funny you should mention that, he says. Funny you should bring that up. It's me, he says. Now, Jesus doesn't normally do this sort of thing. In fact, he can be quite evasive about his identity. People will try to pin him to it, and he'll kind of dance around it. He doesn't want to make it obvious. But for this woman, he makes it obvious. He tells her exactly who he is. He wants her to believe. He wants her to be changed. Well, just then the disciples return. And, and they were surprised to see him talking to this woman, but none of them asked about it because he's Jesus. And are you going to challenge Jesus? And so they, they don't say anything, but it bothers them. And she leaves her water bottle there. And she goes into town and she tells all the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Now, it should be mentioned, this woman here with the five husbands. Let's, let's talk about that for a second, just real briefly here. The normal American way of thinking about that, because in America, if someone came to our church who had been married and divorced five times, you would think they must be hard to live with, right? At the very least, you'd think that. You might think other things, but at the very least, you'd say, I bet they're a joy to be around every day if, 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 if that's what's happening, right? Yeah, that's what you'd think. And there could be lots of reasons, by the way. might not be all their fault. It might not be all. There might not be any other fault. Maybe they just picked the wrong person five times, and they were mean, abusive. Who knows what's going on? But that's what you'd think. You know, even today in America, you'd think it's their fault. Somebody getting divorced five times. That's what you, you'd run through your head. Uh, but that's not how life worked in Jesus' day. Women never divorced unless they were fabulously wealthy, and then they never got remarried if they were fabulously wealthy. Women never. Uh, Women needed men to survive. It was a different world. Men divorced. So here's a woman who's been rejected five times, been kicked out five times, been told to hit the road five times. And maybe she is hard to live with. Like I said, she's really smart and she can be sarcastic. Maybe she, was a, maybe she could be critical. I don't know. Maybe she could be hard. Maybe she could be judgmental or mean. But whatever it was, here's a woman who's been kicked out of the house five times. And now she's living with a guy who's not her husband. Well, what's going on there? Again, see, in our day, people live together frequently before they get married. And I think it's a bad idea. And I think the Bible and statistics would agree with me on that. And if anybody's in here who disagrees with me, on, let's have a conversation. But, but, but leaving that for the side, it happens all the time today. You see people all the time living together before they get married. But in that day, it did not happen very often. And, and, and because, because uh, you would really be taken advantage, fantastically taken advantage of the woman in that situation. And most women's families wouldn't let something like that happen. They'd stand up for her. Uh, but, but this woman doesn't even have that. She's been divorced five times. And now a sixth man's come along and says, well, I won't, I won't marry you, but I'd like to sleep with you if you'd like to live in my house. 
So at least she's got a house. And at least she's got food. She'll have no inheritance. She'll have no uh, provision. It's the best she can do. This is the woman. And why is she coming out there at noon when it's so blistering hot? Well, she's coming out there because none of the other women will go talk with her. It's the only time she can go be by herself. All the other women go in the morning. In the, in the Bible, uh, water, getting the water is women's work. And, uh, and you even see uh, in the Old Testament, uh, 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 Isaac's looking for a wife, and then he sends a guy to the well. Go see where the women are at, because all the women are hanging out there at the well. That's where women are at. You, so you, know, you scoot your eyebrows back, and you go in and, and say hi to the ladies, because that's where they're all at, right, in the morning. But that's not where this woman's at. It's noon, right? And the women won't talk to her. They've all rejected her. She's, 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 she's the worst sort of woman. And the men don't respect her, and the women reject her. She's, uh, uh, I heard a sermon once that, that, that Jesus uses this woman because everybody likes her. And it's just the opposite. Just the opposite. Uh, no one likes her. She's the very bottom of the row of the of the ladder, and Jesus chooses her. You're the one. And she goes back into town. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could he be the Messiah? This woman, who no one respects, who no one likes, who no one looks up to, this woman is the one. And, and uh, people are different than animals because we can imagine this different reality, right? Um, this, this woman, her reality is to be rejected and to be uh, a, a burden. That's her reality. She's sharp-tongued and mean and hard to live with, and uh, that's her reality. You're never going to be popular. You're never going to have friends. You're never going to be respected. You're always going to be poor. You're always going to be the bottom. That's her reality. And Jesus speaks this new reality into her mind. I'm going to give you living water. And I know everything you did, Jesus says. And I love you anyway. It's just one of the coolest stories in the Bible. Even as uh, just literature goes, it's just one of the coolest stories in the Bible. Well, the town, it works. They all, all the people hear her say that and they start coming out towards Jesus. Meanwhile, the disciples urge him, Rabbi, here, get something to eat. Now, remember, the disciples have been in town for the last hour getting food. And now they're coming out and what's going on? And, uh, and Jesus says, oh, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. My will is just to do what God wants me to do. He says, you guys have a saying, don't you? Four months and then the harvest? I tell you, open your eyes, look at the fields, they're ripe for harvest. And as he's saying that, the Samaritans are all coming out of town to see Jesus. Because this woman told them. Because one woman who nobody respected stood up and said something. They told her, they said, we no longer believe in Jesus because of what you said. We can see he's the Savior of the world. I want to pray with you. I, I, uh, I am convinced that Jesus changes hearts. I am convinced that people need to have their hearts changed. And if that's you today, I, I want to pray for you. And if you need to come forward and make any sort of a decision or just get prayed for, you know, come up here at the end of the service and we'll pray for you. Let's pray together. Dear Lord God, I thank you so much for this group. I thank you so much, God, for, for everyone who's in here. I mean, I, God, I don't know what brought them in here. People come for all sorts of different reasons. But here we all are together and... And, uh, Father, for anybody who's carrying a big, heavy load today, I just pray you show them in their mind, in their heart, in spirit, and in truth that, that, that you care and that you don't quit and that you are willing to revive even a broken heart, even a stony heart. And so, God, if anybody in here needs to draw close to you, uh, to, to take that living water, Father, maybe even to be baptized today, to be, to be put under the water themselves and come out brand new. I pray, God, you use this time. And I thank you for Jesus who loves us, even when we're a mess. In Jesus' name, amen.